I'm here with Paul Copan, and we're talking uh, about apologetics. We're talking about the Bible, and one of the things that often comes up, and I'm thankful for you because I know you've you've done some work on this, and you have a new book coming out on this question. But the question is, if God is good, what about so much, so many, well, uh, so much of stuff in the Old Testament? In particular, uh, the one that often gets raised is the killing of so many of the Canaanites. How do you respond to that? How have you responded in, in some of your works? Yeah. Yeah, well, the, uh, there are, again, it's probably the most challenging problem that we face in the Old Testament, and it's one that we ought to be exploring and, and being, I think, more bold about uh, addressing. Uh, when we're dealing with the Canaanite question, uh, when God says in Deuteronomy 20, for example, leave alive nothing that breathes, uh, that you are to utterly destroy. Well, a lot of people think, oh man, this is really serious and sobering language. And, and you read the book of Joshua, it says we, there were no survivors, we, uh, you know, that there was, uh, you know, that, that all were wiped out and so forth. Well, it's interesting that as you read this kind of language in the ancient Near Eastern culture, this kind of a language was common in war texts. Even if you won by a narrow margin mm -hmm. in battle, you could say we totally wiped them out, we turned them to ash, uh, they were utterly destroyed. And so you have this idea that, uh, that oh, when you read it kind of straightforwardly, that this is the, uh, you know, that this is so terrible and horrible. But actually, as you probe a bit more deeply, you read that, well, what's going on in the Old Testament is actually that you have people who are allegedly utterly destroyed, and then a few chapters later, there they are again. In fact, the Israelites, and you know, you read Judge Joshua, mm -hmm. and it says that the land was at peace. There were, you know, that uh, that uh, looked like the enemies had been subdued. And then you read later on in Joshua that no, there are many nations to be driven out. And uh, you read in Judges chapters one and two, you know, they could not drive them out. They could not drive them out. That theme is repeated. So, but didn't it say that they were utterly destroyed and that the land had rest and so on? Well, again, this is classic ancient Near Eastern war rhetoric mm -hmm. that you could exaggerate or hyperbolize. Yeah. Uh, just as uh, you, know, you can have a figurative language in the Psalms where it says the trees of the field clap their hands. Well, it doesn't mean that that's literal. And so I think in the same spirit, we ought to look at this language from the context of the ancient Near East and also look at the text itself where it says they were utterly destroyed. And then we read later on, that they weren't utterly destroyed. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here? In fact, God himself tells the, uh, the people of Judah in, in, in Jeremiah 25 that they're going to be utterly destroyed and their villages will be left in everlasting desolation. And then you read to the end of the book and you see that that's not the case. That mm -hmm. yes, uh, Babylon comes and, and, and disables the economic and political and military uh, structures of Israel or of, of Judah. But, uh, but you see many survivors, some go into exile, most of them stay, re remain behind in the land. And so God didn't utterly destroy them, the same language that is used with the Canaanites. So, so that's one, one tack that I would take. And you know, a, a few other things that are worth keeping in mind uh, would be this. First of all, we're dealing not with just any old people, we're dealing with people who are engaged in criminal activity, such as uh, ritualized prostitution, uh, incest, bestiality, uh, infant sacrifice. Again, these things would be condemned in any civilized society. In fact, God waits for, it waits for this uh, command to be given only when the, the Canaanites are, you know, when their sin has been filled up, God tells Abraham, I'm gonna wait till the sin of the Amorites is completed or filled up. It's only then that the Israelites can come in to take the land. It's only when sin has ripened and, and, uh, and, and now is ready, the judgment is ready to fall. And even so, God tells the, them to drive out the Canaanites. That's the language of, of driving out. So if you drive out, you're not killing them. But what you're doing is you are emphasizing that, uh, that they are to be driven out of the land. And if other people, you know, if people remain behind and, you know, here they are seeing the signs of God's power in, you know, in delivering them from Israel. They are, the, they're a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. They, they go through the Red Sea. And all of these Canaanite peoples know what God has done for them. Yeah. So they see very visibly that there is something remarkable about this people. And so you have indicators that, uh, that, that God is on their side, that God is doing something. It's not as though this is some sort of a private revelation, like God told me to kill the Canaanites and 
you better listen to me. No, this is on public display for all people to see that God yeah. is very evidently in the, in the midst of the people of Israel. And so when you're wondering, well, I don't know if I should trust Moses when he's telling me about this. No, what we actually need to be doing is saying, well, no, the very fact that there is this powerful presence that God, that Moses' leadership is being vindicated or justified or proven right over and over again should give the skeptical Israelite soldier pause to say, you know, even though I don't like this idea of having to drive these people out and, and so on, uh, there is there is something very strong about the the character of Moses who is who got, has God's stamp of approval on him, and so these are the sorts of things we need to be bringing into the conversation. It's not as though God delights in the the, the judgment of the Canaanites; He does so with a reluctant and broken heart. Um, and so so these are some of the things that we ought to weave into our conversation. And uh, there's a lot more nuance, a lot more texture that we can go into, but uh, but those are some things that we ought to be keeping in mind as we enter into this conversation. Yeah. So one of the things, and, and, and help me here that I'm, I'm summing this up for our viewers, w w what I hear you saying, it's, it's really uh, multiple answers to this mm -hmm. challenge or mm -hmm. difficult passages in the Old Testament. And, and the two I, I, hear, I hear you in this piece kind of drawing out is, is number one, um, there's some hyperbolic language there. There's some, there's some expressions there that, that, and some good indications that it's not actually every single person. Mm -hmm. And in particular, we think of you know perhaps women and children, and mm -hmm. and yet at the same time, he's still saying yet God is just a judge, mm -hmm. and we do see judgment there. This mm -hmm. isn't some some might hear some of what you're saying and say, well, he's trying to uh, they're trying to say that God isn't just a judge, and, and mm -hmm. that's not what I hear you saying at all. Mm -hmm. That God is a just judge, and yet mm -hmm. we see how he proclaimed to the people, and the, the Canaanites knew and had heard. Mm -hmm. And yet hadn't repented, and right. and so I think this is a test case, though, to more issues that it's not just one gl kind of glib answer, one approach in apologetics where we just yeah. give one answer and that's yeah. it. But yeah. there's these nuance, there's yeah. these uh, multiple things we should say, yeah. and we should come at this from multiple angles. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I think we could add this too that you know God commands something harsh, true. Um, but we also need to remember that in God's commanding this, it's not as though, say, morality is somehow overturned. I mean, you, we, we talk about the, the wrongness of deception, but in the case of criminal activity, for example, we leave, we leave our lights on. Uh, when we go out at night. Well, that's deception in the anticipation of potential criminal activity. Mm -hmm. Or uh, the question, well, if Nazis are knocking at your door about the Jews in your basement, what are you going to tell them? Well, you, you, you have a, it's morally appropriate to deceive. We see this in Scripture. God even tells mm -hmm. uh, Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 to engage in deception because Saul would want to kill him if he knew he were going to anoint a new king. So God tells him to, if anyone asks you, say that you're going to offer a sacrifice in Bethlehem. And so deception in cases of supreme emergency or criminal activity is morally permissible in the scriptures. You know, Rahab and the, he and the uh, Hebrew midwives in Exodus 1. You know, we see that deception is permi permissible and you know, in this criminal activity or you know, when lives are in jeopardy and God blesses and God rewards uh, and commends those, uh, those, uh, those women. Uh, and and so, so in the same way, God may issue a command to, to, to take Life and some, you know, and what if some people say, well, what if there's innocent life that's taken? Well, in in battle, that will sometimes happen, but what we do see is that there are maybe instances in our in ordinary, you know, kind of in unique circumstances that we're familiar with, such as a hijacked plane taken taken over by terrorists, and they're going to use this plane as a weapon to destroy many many lives, many thousands of people. Well, would the president be justified in saying to the Navy uh, um, jets to shoot the plane out of the sky? Well, I'd say yes, he would be justified, even though it does mean the unfortunate taking of innocent human life on board. Yeah. So there is a moral justification for this, even though it's, it's sad, it's a, it's a last resort, but it isn't a case of supreme emergency. Well, could it not be the case that we have a supreme emergency here of, uh, of, a, of a morally corrupt people and God has given you know, ample warning, the people know about the power of God and they refuse to repent, they refuse to acknowledge this God? Well, you know, maybe it's the case that God has, you know, a good God would have morally justifiable reasons for making this command. Even, so it's, it's, it's exceptional rather than the rule itself. And so these are the sorts of things that, uh, that uh, I think ought to be teased out and, and a lot of people don't often explore, but it's an important consideration as we deal with this yeah. problem. Yeah. So if you're, if you're thinking about this, 
we've just given some general, Paul's given some general responses, but if you want to dig deeper, I'd encourage you to go check out his new book, and uh, we're going to have a link for it on the website, and uh, uh, you can go dig deeper and think through how to answer your friends, answer people you're trying to, uh, to impact for the gospel.